It happened last winter in December. Then I was a third-year university student at the Faculty of Chemistry and Biology. Being away from home, I relied on the limited funds my parents sent me for my day-to-day -day expenses, which often left me feeling financially strained. Despite the challenges, I was determined to excel in my studies as the winter session commenced. As the workload intensified, I became increasingly immersed in my academic pursuits. I found myself dedicating countless hours to studying, sometimes sacrificing sleep in the process. The drive to perform well in all my subjects, aiming to avoid any subpar grades and potentially secure a scholarship for the upcoming semester, consumed my thoughts and actions. I pored over textbooks for days and then I went to exams with a sleepy look, sometimes I allowed myself to play PlayStation for a short time in the evenings. I used to spend my time watching TV shows and occasionally enjoying the solitude of sitting in a cafe alone. I didn't have a lot of friends, and even by the third year, I hadn't made any meaningful connections. I wasn't exactly an outcast, but more like a lone wolf who kept to themselves. I didn't get into their affairs, and no one got into my affairs either, although sometimes out of the corner of my ear, I heard what I call a strange unpleasant or just a nerd. That's how I was a nerd and led my own boring life, which made me happy. Looking forward, I hope to have some time to relax and indulge in better meals. If my scholarship gets increased and I receive financial assistance, it would be a welcome relief in the upcoming months. As I already said, I didn't particularly complain about life, although there was one problem in it. An annoying neighbor who resides on the other side of the wall. He not only caused problems for me but also for others. He would frequently blast music from his apartment, often continuing well into the middle of the night. As a result, concerned neighbors would call the police, and the loud noises would temporarily cease. His circle of friends reminded me of drug addicts and homeless people, often mistaking my phone calls for his foolish antics. Following one incident, I made a concerted effort to avoid any encounters with him. I grew tired of enduring sleepless nights due to his disturbances, so I reached out to the authorities. A police squad promptly responded, vigorously pounding on the doors of this individual. Eventually, the door swung open, putting an end to the commotion caused by this troublesome person and I saw my neighbor's drunk face. That was a man in his thirties. He was not shaved. He appeared unkempt, as if he had been plucked from a neglected corner of his apartment. I swear, if there will be a limit of two more complaints and I am raising the case of your eviction, understood? Strictly said the district police officer. Next day. I experienced a sense of unease when I saw a person of a particular social type waiting for me outside my door. The next moment, he pulled out a knife and warned me about the consequences, if I call the cops again. The stench of alcohol from him was unbearable. I wanted to go to the police again, but I got scared every time I returned home, I looked very carefully to see if there was anyone on another floor or near my door. I was constantly vigilant, checking for any potential threats. Despite feeling afraid, I managed to focus and pass my exams after several difficult days. My neighbor continued to have noisy parties, which made it challenging to sleep at night. I found myself wishing him all the worst so that he would finally die and stop poisoning the world with his existence. Thankfully, the situation eventually resolved, and I was able to focus on my studies. I was feeling exhausted and bored, spending most of my time at home playing video games. When the new year arrived, my parents and I decided that I would go home to my hometown for the holidays. However, I was still feeling a bit uneasy about my former neighbor, who was recently evicted from our building. I worried that he might blame me for his eviction and harm me. To add to my worries, I noticed a strange and nauseating smell near my apartment building that seemed to be getting worse each day. It smelled like something rotten and disgusting, and I couldn't bear it. The stench was so bad that even approaching my apartment made me feel sick. Despite my fears and the smell, I managed to make it to the holiday season and had a great time with my family. When I returned to my apartment, the smell was gone, and I felt much more at ease. On the night of December 28, my sweet dream released the knock on the door. Startled, I jumped out of bed and checked the clock, it was already half past three in the morning. I wondered who could need me at such an hour. I heard a quiet voice outside my door. Inspector Wilson, please open the door sir. I looked through the peephole and saw the man in uniform standing there. He informed me that a murder had taken place in our neighborhood and that I was needed as a witness. I quickly got dressed, putting on a t-shirt and slippers, and went outside. 
As I opened the door, a terrible nauseating smell hit me in the nose, and I saw that the door of my neighbor's house was open, with police officers walking around inside. Despite my shock, I assured the officer that I hadn't touched the victim. The police escorted me to the kitchen, where the smell became even more unbearable, causing me to cover my mouth and nose with my hand. The police did the same thing, in the middle of the floor, among the bottles lay the corpse of a man, with the mane clotted blood from his eyes. A knife was sticking out and I immediately remembered where I had seen him, the one whom threatened me. The experts took a couple of pictures and cordoned off the room stumbling and the bottles. We went further to the bath, there hung the corpse of that son of a bitch, who tortured me for months. Despite his dark blue appearance, I still recognized him, and here it was even stronger, so I vomited several more times. Not surprisingly, the guy here has such a smell, cause the corpses had lain for almost a week, the inspector patiently explained everything. It's just everyday life, one killed the other and then hanged himself in the bathroom. I noticed that, together with shock and nausea, I felt some kind of jubilation, not unusual joy. This bastard from whom there were so many problems and not only for me, now hanging in a dead noose. I stood a little longer and watched the corpses being carried out. Suddenly woke up a grandmother who lived next door. Her cat jumped out at the policeman's, the old woman shouted, but the cat behaved strangely at first, huddled in the corner of the entrance, and then, as if noticing something, rushed into that ill-fated apartment and stared at the dangling bathroom hinges and she hissed. I once heard a rumor that cats can see the souls of the recently deceased and react to them. I witnessed a police officer picking up a disheveled cat who seemed to be clutching tightly to him. The cat's owner was so relieved to have her pet back and quickly shut the door. Later that night, I expressed my own sense of relief that I wouldn't have to deal with any more disturbances or loud noises. The holiday season had ended, and things were finally back to normal in Detroit. When I shared the story with my family, I even asked my father for a traumatic gun as a precautionary measure. However, my parents suggested that I move to a different location for safety. I insisted that I felt safe where I was and that everything was now calm. Oh how deceived I was. The first day of my stay went smoothly, but then inexplicable phenomena began to unfold. It started one fateful night when I was abruptly awakened by a rhythmic knocking coming from the adjacent wall, behind which resided my repugnant neighbor. Not constant, but intermittent. Each time a resounding thud echoed, jolting me from slumber, leaving me restless for hours. Had those imbeciles managed to find their way back in? Gradually, a series of peculiar events unfolded. Returning home from the store, I stumbled upon a shattered plate in the living room, a plate that I never left there. It appeared as if someone had brought it from the kitchen, only to discard it in pieces. Then, in sudden bursts, the lights would flicker, plunging the room into darkness before reigniting. A grimy silhouette, of unknown origin, materialized upon one of the walls. Seeking solace and answers, I sought guidance from a priest and a psychiatrist. Their advice, to sanctify the apartment with holy water and recite prayers in every corner. Additionally, they prescribed tranquilizers to aid in restful sleep. Following the cleansing ritual with holy water, a semblance of tranquility seemed to descend. The prescribed pills brought solace to my frayed nerves, and for 20 days, all was calm. As I marked the passage of time on my calendar, a realization settled upon me, the quietude that had enveloped the apartment heralded the 40th day, the 40th day since the demise of my detestable neighbor. With caution, I performed the purification ritual before retiring to bed, clutching my father's pistol, just in case. Deep in the night, a force hurled me from my bed, dragging me across the floor, shrouded in dim illumination, where a grotesque silhouette loomed before my eyes. Desperation and terror consumed me, as I screamed in an attempt to escape, only to be gripped once more and violently flung against the unyielding wall. In anguish, I crawled towards the safety of my bed, reaching for the solace of my father's firearm, an act driven by instinct and desperation. Simultaneously, from that crimson stain on the stage, eerie creatures slithered forth, their presence an abomination. Summoning the last vestiges of my strength, I sprinted towards the entrance, seeking refuge beyond the threshold. Alas, the door lock resisted my frantic attempts to escape. The grotesque beings continued their macabre advance, their footsteps resonating ominously as they emerged, unhurriedly, from the very walls that had concealed them. Determined, I illuminated the hallway, unleashing a cacophony of defiant screams and emptying my firearm upon those nightmarish figures. The bullets depleted, the gun slipped from my trembling hands, 
and darkness engulfed me as consciousness slipped away. Later, I woke up in an unfamiliar place. It seemed to be a hospital. Finally, he's regained consciousness. I overheard in passing. Two men were sitting next to me, one in civilian clothes and the other in a police uniform. The one in civilian clothes calmly muttered. So, what happened that night? I weakly replied in a soft voice. I can barely remember myself. I recall some creatures crawling out of the wall, and I tried to shoot them with a non-lethal pistol. The man in civilian clothes responded. Neighbors gathered and called the police when they heard your screams and gunshots. They found you unconscious in your bed. Bullet holes were discovered in one of the walls. Confused, I said. But I was near the front door, not in bed. And what about the dark red stain in the bedroom? What do you make of that? The men exchanged glances. There was no stain. James, it's possible that you experienced a severe nervous breakdown. How many hours do you sleep per day? I replied. Well, around five hours. What are you trying to say? That I've gone insane? The man explained. Don't get worked up. The heavy workload from your studies could have triggered hallucinations. I questioned them. And what about the murder in the neighboring apartment? Inspector Wilson and other police officers confirmed it. The investigators widened their eyes and examined me closely. What murders? Nobody has lived in that apartment for a long time. And who is Inspector Wilson? Are you sure you haven't mistaken things, student? I persisted. There was a murder and a suicide, with a knife in the eye and a hanging in the bathroom. Yes? The law enforcement representatives stood frozen in their places. But how do you know? Just then, a nurse arrived and informed me that the session was over. Shortly after, something was injected into me, and I slipped into a deep forgetfulness. A month later, I was discharged from the hospital and resumed my studies at the university. However, my enthusiasm had diminished. I started dedicating more time to sports and leisure. My parents found a new apartment closer to the university for me. I'm not sure if it was all in my head or if it was just a dream. But a year later, I found out that some man had moved into my previous apartment and went insane within six months. And in that ill-fated apartment, another murder and suicide occurred. Choose your apartments carefully. You never know who your neighbor might be.